Chapter Ten of Potash and Perlmutter, their co-partnership ventures and adventures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Potash and Perlmutter, their co-partnership ventures and adventures by Montague Glass. Chapter Ten. The Small Dry Goods Company's order was the forerunner of a busy season that taxed the energies of not only Abe and Morris, but of their entire business staff as well. And when the hot weather set in, Morris could not help noticing the fagged-out appearance of Miss Cohen, the bookkeeper. "'You should give that girl a vacation, Abe,' he said. "'She worked hard, and we ought to show her a little consideration.' "'I know, Morris,' Abe replied. But she ain't the only person that works hard around here, Morris. I work hard too, Morris. But I ain't getting no vacation. That's a new idea when you got Morris. Everybody gives it their bookkeeper a vacation, Abe, Morris protested. Do they? Abe rejoined. Well, if bookkeepers get vacations, Morris, where are we going to stop? First thing you know, Morris, we'll be given cutters vacations and operators vacations, and before we get through, we got our workroom half empty yet and paying for full time already. If she wants a vacation for two weeks, I ain't got no objections, Morris. Only we don't pay her no wages while she's gone. You can't do that, Abe, Morris said. That would be laying her off, Abe. That wouldn't be no vacation. But we gotta have somebody here to keep our books while she's away, Morris. Abe cried. We gotta make it a living, Morris. We can't shut down just because Miss Cohen gets a vacation. And so it stands, Morris. We gotta pay Miss Cohen wages for doing nothing, Morris. And also we got to pay it wages to somebody else for doing something what Miss Cohen should be doing what she ain't, ain't it? Sure, we gotta get a substitute for her while she's away, Morris agreed. But I guess it won't break us. All right, Morris, Abe replied. If I gotta hear it all summer about this here vacation business, I'm satisfied. I got enough to do in the store without worrying about that, Morris. Only one thing I gotta say it, Morris. We gotta have a bookkeeper to take her place while she's away, and you gotta attend to that, Morris. That's all I gotta say. Morris nodded and hastened to break the good news to Miss Cohen, who, for the remainder of the week, divided her time between Potash and Perlmutter's accounts and a dozen multicolored railroad folders. Look at that, Morris, Abe said, as he gazed through the glass paneling of the showroom toward the bookkeeper's desk. That girl ain't done a stroke of work since we told her she can go already. What are we running here anyway, a cloak and suit business or a cut-rate ticket office? Don't you worry about her, Abe, Morris replied. She's got a cash book and day book posted, and she also got it a substitute. He's coming this afternoon. He's coming, Abe said. So she got it a young fellow, Morris. Well, Abe, Morris replied, what harm is there in that? He's a decent, respectable young fellow by the name of Tachman, what works as a bookkeeper by the Kuzushko Bank. They give him a two weeks vacation and he comes to work by us, Abe. That's a fine way to spend a vacation, Morris, Abe commented. Why don't he go up to Tannersville or so? "'Because he's got to help his father out nights in his cigar store "'what he keeps it on Avenue B,' Morris answered. "'His father is Max Tuckman's brother. "'You know, Max Tuckman, drummer for Lapidus and Ellenbogen.' "'Sure, I know him. A loudmouth fellow, Morris. "'Got a whole lot to say for himself. "'A sport and a gambler, too,' Abe said. "'He'd sooner play auction pinnacle than eat, Morris. "'I bet you he turns in an expense account "'like he was on a honeymoon every trip.' The last time I seen this here, Max Tuckman was up in the Duluth. He was riding in a buggy with that lady buyer from Mo Gershel's cloak department. Well, I suppose he sold her a big bill of goods too, Abe, ain't it? Morris rejoined. He's an up-to-date feller, Abe. If anybody wants to sell goods to lady buyers, they got to be up-to-date, ain't it? And so far what I hear it, nobody told me you make such a big success with lady buyers, neither, Abe. Abe shrugged his shoulders. "'There ain't here nor there, Morris,' he grunted. "'The thing is this. If this young fellow by the name of Tachman does Miss Cohen's work as good as Miss Cohen does it, I'm satisfied.' 
there was no need for apprehension on that score however for when the substitute bookkeeper arrived he proved to be an accurate and industrious young fellow and despite miss cohen's absence the work of potash and perlmutter's office proceeded with orderly dispatch that's a fine young fellow morris abe commented as he and his partner sat in the firm's showroom on the second day of miss cohen's vacation who's this you're talking about morris asked this here bookkeeper abe replied what's his first name now morris ralph morris said ralph abe cried that's a name i couldn't remember it in a million years morris why not abe morris replied ralph ain't no harder than mo or jake abe for my part i ain't got no trouble in remembering that name and anyhow abe why should an up-to-date family like the tuchmans give their boys such back number names like jake or mo jacob and moses was decent respectable people in the old country morris abe corrected solemnly i know it abe morris rejoined but that was long since many years ago already now in another time entirely in new york city and anyhow with such names we got it in our books abe you shouldn't have no trouble remembering ralph sure not abe agreed dismissing the subject so i'll call him ike for two weeks he wouldn't mind it morris shrugged for my part you can call him andrew carnegie he said only let's not stand here talking about it all day abe I see by the paper this morning that Marcus Bramson from Syracuse is at the Prince William Hotel, Abe, and you says he was going up to see him. That's your style, Abe, an old-fashioned fellow like Marcus Bramson. If you couldn't sell him a bill of goods, Abe, you couldn't sell nobody. He ain't no lady buyer, Abe. Abe glared indignantly at his partner. Well, Morris, he said, if you ain't satisfied with the way I sell goods, you know what you can do. I'll do the inside work, and you can go out on the road. It's a dog's life, Morris, any way you look at it. And maybe, Morris, you would have a good time taking buggy rides with lady buyers. For my part, Morris, I got something better to do with my time. He seized his hat, still glaring at Morris, who remained quite unmoved by his partner's indignation. I heard it what you tell me now several times before already, Abe, he said. If you want it that Max Tuchman or Klinger and Klein or some of them other fellows should cop out a good customer of ours like Marcus Bramson, Abe, maybe you'll hang around here a little longer. Abe retorted by banging the showroom door behind him, and as he disappeared into the street, Morris indulged in a broad, triumphant grin. When Abe returned an hour later, he found Morris going over the monthly statements with Ralph Tuchman. Morris looked up as Abe entered. What's the matter, Abe? he cried. You look worried. Worried, Abe replied. I ain't worried, Morris. Did you see Marcus Bramson? Morris asked. Sure, I seen him, said Abe. He's coming down here at half past three o'clock this afternoon. You needn't trouble yourself about him, Morris. Abe hung up his hat while Morris and Ralph Tuchman once more fell to the work of comparing the statements. Look here, Morris, Abe said at length. Who do you think I'd seen up at the Prince William Hotel? I ain't no mind reader, Abe, Morris replied. Who did you seen it? Miss Atkinson, cloak buyer for the Emporium Duluth, Abe replied. That's Mo Gershel's store. Morris stopped comparing the statements, while Ralph Tuchman continued his writing. "'She's just come in from the West, Morris,' Abe went on. "'She ain't registered yet when I was going out, and she won't be in the arrival of buyers till tomorrow morning.' "'Did you speak to her?' Morris asked. "'Sure, I spoke to her,' Abe said. "'I says good morning, and she recognized me right away. "'I asked after Mo, and she says he's well, "'and I says if she comes down here for fall goods.' She says she ain't going to talk no business for a couple of days, and it's a long time already since she was in New York, and she wants to look around her. Then I says it's a fine weather for driving just now. He paused for a moment and looked at Morris. Yes, Morris said. And what did she say? She says sure it is, Abe continued. 
only she says she's got thrown out of a wagon last fall so she's kind of sour on horses she says nowadays she don't go out except in automobiles automobiles morris exclaimed and ralph tuckman whose protruding ears sharp pointed nose and gold spectacles did not belie his inquisitive disposition ceased writing to listen more closely to abe's story that's what she said morris abe replied and so i says for my part i liked it better automobiles as horses why abe morris cried you ain't never rode in an automobile in your whole life sure not morris i'm lucky if i get to a funeral once in a while ike he broke off suddenly you better get them statements mailed ralph tuchman rose sadly and repaired to the office that's a smart young fellow morris abe commented and while you can't tell much about a fellow from his face morris i never seen them long years on anyone that minded his own business you understand and besides i ain't taking no chances on his uncle max tuchman getting advance information about this here mo gershel's buyer morris nodded maybe you're right abe he murmured you was telling me what this miss abrahamson said abe miss atkinson morris abe corrected not abrahamson well what did she say morris asked so she asks me if i ever went automobiling abe went on and i says sure i did and right away quick as i seen what she means and i says how about going this afternoon and she says she's agreeable so i says morris all right i says we'll mix business with pleasure i says i told her we'll go into an automobile to the bronx already and when we come back to the store at about say five o'clock we'll look over the line then after that we'll go to dinner and after dinner we'll go to the theater how's that morris i heard it worse ideas than that abe morris replied because if you get this here miss aronson down here in the store naturally she thinks if she gives us the order she gets better treatment at the dinner and at the theater afterward that's the way i figured it out morris abe agreed and also i says to myself morris we'll enjoy it a good automobile ride me morris cried what have i got to do with this here automobile ride abe what have you got to do with it morris abe repeated why morris i'm surprised to hear you should talk that way you got everything to do with it i'm a back number morris i don't know nothing about selling goods to lady buyers ain't it you say it yourself a feller has got to be up to date to sell goods to lady buyers so naturally you being an up-to-date member of this concern you got to take miss atkinson out in the automobile but abe morris protested i ain't never rode in an automobile and there wouldn't be no pleasure in it for me anyway abe why don't you go abe you say it yourself you lead it a dog's life on the road now here's a chance for you to enjoy yourself abe and you should go besides abe you got commercial traveler's accident insurance and i ain't the automobile ain't come until half past one mars abe replied between now and then you can get it a hundred policies of accident insurance no morris this here lady buyer business is up to you i got a pointer from saul Klinger to ring up a concern on forty-sixth street which i done so and fifteen dollars it costed me that automobile is coming here for you at half past one and after all that you got to do is to go up to the prince william hotel and ask for miss atkinson but abe morris protested i don't even know here this miss isaacson not isaacson abe repeated atkinson you better write that name down morris before you forget it never mind abe morris rejoined i don't need to write down things to remember em. i don't have to call a young feller out of his name just because my memory is bad abe the name i'll remember good enough when it comes right down to it only why i should go out automobile riding with this miss atkinson abe i'm the inside partner ain't it and you're the outside man you know what i think abe i think you're scared to ride in an automobile me scared abe cried why should i be scared morris a little thing like a broken leg or a broken arm morris don't scare me i ain't going because it ain't my business to go it's your idea this lady buyer business and if you don't want to go we'll charge the fifteen dollars what i paid out the profit and loss and call the whole thing off he rose to his feet thrust out his waistline 
and made a dignified exit by way of closing the discussion a moment later however he returned with less dignity than haste morris he hissed that young fella that that now ike is telephoning well morris replied one telephone message ain't going to put us into bankruptcy abe bankruptcy nothing abe exclaimed he's telephoning to his uncle max Dockman. morris jumped to his feet and on the tips of their toes they darted to the rear of the store all right uncle max they heard ralph Tochman say i'll see you tonight good-bye abe and morris exchanged significant glances while ralph slunk guiltily away to miss cohen's desk let's fire him on the spot abe said morris shook his head what good will that do abe morris replied we ain't certain that he told max Tochman nothing abe for all you mean no max may have rung him up about something quite different already i believe it morris abe said ironically but anyhow i'm going to ring up that automobile concern on forty-sixth street and tell him to send it around here at twelve o'clock then you can go up there to the hotel and if that miss atkinson ain't had her lunch yet buy it for her morris for so sure as you stand there i bet that young feller ike has rung up this here max tuchman and told him all about us going up here to take her out in an automobile i bet your max will get the biggest automobile he can find up there right away and he's gonna steal her away from us sure if we don't hustle dreams you got it abe morris said how should this here young feller ralph tuchman know that miss aronson was a customer of his uncle max tuchman abe abe looked at morris more in sorrow than in anger morris he said do me a favor once and write the name down a t at k i n kin s o n son atkinson not aronson that's what i said atkinson abe morris protested and if you're so scared we're going to lose her abe go ahead and phone we got to sell goods to lady buyers sometime abe and we may as well make the break now abe waited to hear no more but hastened to the phone and when he returned a few minutes later he found that morris had gone to the barber shop across the street twenty minutes afterward a sixty horsepower machine arrived at the store door just as morris came up the steps of the barber shop underneath wasserbauer's cafe and restaurant he also bumped into Philip Plotkin of Kleinberg and Plotkin, who was licking the refractory wrapper of a wheeling stogie, with one eye fixed on the automobile in front of his competitor's store. "'Hello, Morris,' Philip cried. "'Pretty high-toned customers you must got it when they come down to the store in automobiles, ain't it?' Morris flashed his gold fillings in a smile of triumphant superiority. That ain't no customer's automobile, Philip, he said. That's for us an automobile, what we take it our customers riding in. Why don't you take it out credit men from commission houses riding, Morris, Philip rejoined, as Morris stepped from the curb to cross the street. This was an allusion to the well-known circumstance that with credit men, a customer's automobile riding inspires as much confidence as his betting on the horse races and when Morris climbed into the tonneau, he paid little attention to Abe's instructions. So busy was he glancing around him for prying credit men. At length, with a final jar and jerk, the machine sprang forward, and for the rest of the journey, Morris's mind was emptied of every other apprehension, save that engendered of passing trucks or streetcars. Finally, the machine drew up in front of the Prince William and Morris scrambled out, trembling in every limb. He made at once for the clerk's desk. Please send this to Miss Isaacson, he said, handing out a firm card. The clerk consulted an index and shook his head. No Miss Isaacson registered here, he said. Oh, sure not, Morris cried, smiling apologetically. I mean Miss Aronson. Once more, the clerk pawed over his card index. You've got the wrong hotel, he declared. I don't see any Miss Aronson here either. 
Morris scratched his head. He mentally passed in review Jacobson, Abrahamson, and every other biblical proper name combined with the suffix son, but rejected them all. The lady what I want to see is a buyer for a department store in Duluth. What arrived here this morning? Morris explained. Let me see, the clerk mused. Buyer, eh? What was she a buyer of? Cloaks and suits, Morris answered. Suits, eh? The clerk commented. Let me see, buyer of suits. Was that the lady that was expecting somebody with an automobile? Morris nodded emphatically. Well, that party called for her, and they left here about ten minutes ago, the clerk replied. What? Morris gasped. Maybe it was five minutes ago, the clerk continued. A gentleman with a red tie and a fine diamond pin. His name was Tucker, or Tuckerton, or Tuckman, Morris cried. That's right, said the clerk. He was a... But Morris turned on his heel and darted wildly toward the entrance. Say, he cried, hailing the carriage agent. Did you see that lady and a gent in an automobile leave here five minutes ago? Ladies and gents leave here in automobiles on an average of every three minutes, said the carriage agent. Sure, I know, Morris continued. But the gent wore a red tie with a big diamond. Red tie with a big diamond, the carriage agent repeated. Oh, yeah, I remember now. The lady wanted to know where they were going, and the red necktie says up to the Heather Bloom Inn, and something about getting back to his store afterward. Morris nodded vigorously. So I guess they went up to the Heather Bloom Inn, the carriage agent said. Once more, Morris darted away without waiting to thank his informant, and again he climbed into the tonneau of the machine. Do you know where the Heather Bloom Inn is? he asked the chauffeur. What you trying to do? The chauffeur commented. Kid me? I ain't trying to do nothing, Morris explained. I ask it you a simple question. Do you know where the Heather Bloom Inn is? Say, do you know where Baxter Street is? The chauffeur asked. And then, without waiting for an answer, he opened the throttle and they glided round the corner into Fifth Avenue. It was barely half past twelve and the tide of fashionable traffic had not yet set in. Hence, the motor car made good progress, nor was it until 50th Street was reached that a block of traffic caused them to halt. An automobile had collided with a delivery wagon, and a wordy contest was waging between the driver of the wagon, the chauffeur, one of the occupants of the automobile, and a traffic squad policeman. You don't know your business, a loud voice proclaimed, addressing the policeman. If you did, you wouldn't be sitting up here like a dummy already. This here driver run into us. We didn't run into him. It was the male occupant of the automobile that spoke, and in vain did his fair companion clutch at the tails of the linen duster that he wore. He was in the full tide of eloquence and thoroughly enjoying himself. The mounted policeman maintained his composure, the calm of a volcano before its eruption the ominous lull that precedes the tornado. And furthermore, continued the passenger, throwing out his chest, whereupon sparkled a large diamond enfolded in crimson silk, and furthermore I'll see to it that them superiors of yours down below hears of it. The mounted policeman jumped nimbly from his horse, and as Morris rose in the tonneau of his automobile he saw Max Tuchman being jerked bodily to the street, while his fair companion shrieked hysterically. Morris opened the door and sprang out. With unusual energy, he wormed his way through the crowd that surrounded the policeman and approached the side of the automobile. Lady, lady, he cried. I don't remember your name, but I'm a friend of Max Tuckman here. I'll get you out of this here crowd in a minute. He opened the door opposite to the side of which Tuchman had made his enforced exit and offered his hand to Max's trembling companion. The lady hesitated a brief moment. Any port in a storm, she argued to herself, and a moment later she was seated beside Morris in the latter's car, which was moving up the avenue at a good twenty-mile gait. 
the chauffeur took advantage of the traffic policeman's professional engagement with max tuckman and it was not until the next mounted officer hoved into view that he brought his car down to its lawful gate if you're a friend of mr tuckman's said the lady at length why didn't you go with him to the police station and bail him out morris grinned i guess you'll know when i tell it you that my name is mr perlmutter he announced of potash and perlmutter the lady turned around and glanced uneasily at mars is that so she said well i'm pleased to meet you mr perlmutter so naturally i don't feel so bad as i might about it morris went on naturally the lady commented she looked about her apprehensively perhaps we'd better go back to the prince william don't you think so why you was going up to the heatherbloom inn with max tuchman wasn't you morris said how did you find that out she asked a small-sized bird told it me morris replied jocularly but anyhow no jokes nor nothing why shouldn't we go up and have lunch at the heatherbloom inn and then you can come down and look at our line anyhow well said the lady if you can show me those suits as well as mr tuchman could i suppose it really won't make any difference i can show em to you better than any mr tuchman could morris said and now so long as you are content to come downtown we won't talk business no more till we get there they had an excellent lunch at the heatherbloom inn and many a hearty laugh from the lady testified to her appreciation of morris's naive conversation the hour passed pleasantly for Morris, too, since the lady's unaffected simplicity set him entirely at ease. To be sure, she was neither young nor handsome, but she had all the charm that self-reliance and ability give to a woman. A good smart business head she's got it, Morris said to himself, and I wish I could remember that name. He had not feared that his companion might think it strange. He would have asked her her name outright. Once he called her Miss Aronson, but the look of amazement with which she favored him effectually discouraged him from further experiment in that direction. Thenceforth he called her Lady, a title which made her smile and seemed to keep her in excellent humor. At length they concluded their meal, quite a modest repast and comparatively reasonable in price, and as they rose to leave, Morris looked toward the door and gasped, involuntarily he could hardly believe his senses for there blocking the entrance stood a familiar bearded figure it was marcus bramson the conservative back number marcus bramson and against him leaned a tall stout person not quite as young as her clothes and wearing a large picture hat obviously this was not mrs bramson and the blush with which marcus bramson recognized morris only confirmed the latter's suspicions mr bramson murmured a few words to the youthfully dressed person at his side and she glared venomously at morris who precipitately followed his companion to the automobile five minutes afterward he was chatting with the lady as they sped along riverside drive duluth must be a fine town he suggested it is indeed the lady agreed i have some relatives living there that should make it pleasant for you lady morris went on and thereafter the conversation touched on relatives whereupon morris favored his companion with a few intimate details of his family life that caused her to laugh until she was completely out of breath to be sure morris could see nothing remarkably humorous about it himself and when one or two anecdotes intended to be pathetic were received with tears of mirth rather than sympathy he felt somewhat annoyed nevertheless he hid his chagrin and it was not long before the familiar sign of wasserbauer's cafe and restaurant warned morris that they had reached their destination he assisted his companion to alight and ushered her into the showroom just a minute lady he said i'll bring mr potash here but the lady protested i thought mr lapidus was the gentleman who had charge of it that's all right morris said you just wait and i'll bring mr potash here 
he took the stairs to the cutting room three at a jump abe he cried miss aronson is downstairs abe's face which wore a worried frown grew darker still as he regarded his partner malevolently what's the matter with you morris he said can't you remember a simple name like atkinson atkinson morris cried that's it atkinson i've been trying to remember it that name for hours already but anyway she's downstairs abe abe rose from his task and made at once for the stairs with morris following at his heels in four strides he had reached the showroom but no sooner had he crossed the threshold than he started back violently thereby knocking the breath out of morris who was nearly precipitated to the floor morris he hissed who is that there lady why morris answered that's miss aronson i mean atkinson ain't it atkinson abe yelled that ain't miss atkinson then who is she morris asked who is she abe repeated that's a fine question for you to ask me you take a lady for a fifteen dollar automobile ride and spend as much more on lunch on her and you don't even know her name a cold perspiration broke out on morris and he fairly staggered into the showroom lady he croaked do me a favor and tell me what your name is please the lady laughed well mr perlmutter she said i'm sure this is most extraordinary of course there is such a thing as combining business and pleasure but as i told mr tuchman when he insisted on taking me up to the heatherbloom inn the board of trustees control the placing of the orders i have only the perfunctory duty to perform when i examine the finished clothing board of trustees morris exclaimed yes the board of trustees for the home for female orphans of veterans at oceanhurst long island i am the superintendent miss taylor and i had an appointment at lapidus and ellenbogen's to inspect a thousand blue serge suits lapidus and ellenbogen were the successful bidders you know and there was really no reason for mr tuchman's hospitality since i had nothing whatever to do with their receiving the contract nor could i possibly influence the placing of any future orders morris nodded slowly so you ain't miss atkinson then lady he said the lady laughed again i'm very sorry if i'm the innocent recipient under false pretenses of a lunch and an automobile ride she said rising and you'll excuse me if i must hurry away to keep my appointment at lapidus and ellenbogen's i have to catch a train back to oceanhurst at five o'clock too she held out her hand and morris took it sheepishly i hope you'll forgive me she said i can't blame you lady morris replied as they went toward the door it ain't your fault lady he held the door open for her and as for that max tuchman he said i hope they sent him up for life abe stood in the showroom doorway as morris returned from the front of the store and fixed his partner with a terrible glare yes morris he said you're a fine piece of work i must say morris shrugged his shoulders and sat down that's what comes of not minding your own business he retorted i'm the inside abe and you're the outside and it's your business to look after the out-of-town trade i told you i don't know nothing about this here lady buyer business you ordered the automobile i ain't got nothing to do with it and anyhow i don't want to hear no more about it a pulse was beating in abe's cheeks as he paced up and down before replying you don't want to hear no more about it morris i know he said but i want to hear about it i got a right to hear about it morris i got a right to hear it how a man could make such a fool out of himself tell me morris what name did you ask it for when you went to the clerk at the prince william hotel morris jumped to his feet lillian russell he roared and banged the showroom door behind him for the remainder of the day morris and abe avoided each other and it was not until the next morning that morris ventured to address his partner did you get it any word from marcus bramson he asked i ain't seen or heard nothing abe replied i can't understand it morris the man promised me mind you 
he would be here sure maybe you seen him up to the hotel mars i seen him morris replied but not at the hotel abe i seen him up at the heatherbloom inn abe with a lady with a lady abe cried are you sure it was a lady mars maybe she was a relation relations you don't take it to no expensive places like the heatherbloom inn abe morris replied and anyhow this wasn't no relation abe this was a lady why should a man blush for a relation ain't it did he blush abe asked but the question remained unanswered for as morris was about to reply the store door opened and marcus bramson entered ah mr bramson abe cried ain't it a beautiful weather he seized the newcomer by the hand and shook it up and down mr bramson received the greeting solemnly abe he said i am a man of my word ain't it and so i come here to buy goods but all the same i tell you the truth i was pretty near going to lapidus and ellenbogens lapidus and ellenbogens abe cried why so at this juncture morris appeared at the showroom door and beamed at mr bramson who looked straight over his head in cold indifference whereupon morris found some business to attend to in the rear of the store that's what i said mr bramson replied lapidus and ellenbogens and you would have deserved it mr bramson abe protested did i ever done you something that you should talk that way me you never done nothing to abe said mr bramson but to treat a lady what is a lady abe like a dog abe i must say it i'm surprised i never treated no lady like a dog mr bramson abe replied you must be mistaken well maybe it wasn't you abe mr bramson went on but if it wasn't you it was your partner there mr morris perlmutter yesterday i seen him up to the heatherbloom inn abe and i assure you abe i was never before in my life in such a high priced place coffee and cake abe believe me one dollar and a quarter he paused to let the information sink in but what could i do he asked i was walking through the side entrance of the prince william hotel yesterday abe just on my way down to see you when i seen a lady sitting on a bench looking like she would like to cry only for the shame for the people well abe i looked again abe and you wouldn't believe it abe it was miss atkinson who used to work for me as a saleswoman and got a job at the golden rule store elmira as assistant buyer and now she's buyer with mo gershel the emporium duluth abe nodded he knew it was coming so naturally i asked her what is the matter with her and she says potash and perlmutter had an appointment to take her out in an automobile at two o'clock and here it was three o'clock already and they ain't showed up yet potash and perlmutter's is friends of mine miss atkinson i says and i'm sure something must have happened or otherwise they would not have failed to be here so i says for her to ring you up abe and find out but she says she would see you first in she wouldn't ring you up for all the automobiles in new york so i says well i says if you don't want to ring her up i'll ring em up and she says i should mind my own business so then i says if you wouldn't ring em up and i wouldn't ring em up i'll do this for you miss atkinson you and me will go for an automobile ride i says and we'll have just so good a time as if potash and perlmutter were paying for it and so we did abe i took miss atkinson up to the heatherbloom inn and it costed me thirty dollars abe including a cigar which i wouldn't charge you nothing for charge me nothing abe cried of course you wouldn't charge me nothing you wouldn't charge me nothing mr bramson because i wouldn't pay you nothing i didn't ask you to take miss atkinson out in an automobile i know you didn't abe mr bramson replied firmly but either you will pay for it or i will go to lapidus and ellenbogens and they will pay for it they'll be only too glad to pay for it abe because i bet you miss atkinson she give em a pretty big order already abe abe frowned and then shrugged all right he said if i must i must so come on now mr bramson and look over the line in the meantime morris had repaired to the bookkeeper's desk and was looking over the day-book with an unseeing eye his mind was occupied with bitter reflections when ralph tuchman interrupted him mr perlmutter he said i'm going to leave going to leave morris cried what for well in the first place i don't like it to be called out of my name he continued mr potash calls me ike and my name is ralph 
if a man's name is ralph mr perlmutter he naturally don't like to be called ike i know it morris agreed but some people ain't got a good memory for names ralph even myself i forget it names too once it in a while occasionally but that ain't all mr perlmutter ralph went on yesterday while you was out mr potash accuses me something terrible accuse you morris said what does he accuse you for he accused me that i rang up my uncle max tuchman and tell him about a miss atkinson at the prince william hotel ralph continued i didn't do it mr perlmutter believe me uncle max rung me up and i was going to tell you and mr potash what he rung me up for if he didn't look at me like i was a pickpocket when i was coming away from the phone yesterday i didn't look at you like a pickpocket ralph morris said what did your uncle max ring you up for why he wanted me to tell you that so long as you was so kind and gives me this here vacation job i should do you a good turn too he says that miss atkinson tells him yesterday she was going out automobile riding with you and so he says i should tell you not to go to any expense by miss atkinson on account that she already bought her fall line from uncle max when he was in duluth three weeks ago already and that she is now in new york strictly on vacation only and not to buy goods morris nodded slowly well ralph he said you're a good smart boy and i want you to stay until miss cohen comes back and maybe we'll raise you a couple of dollars a week till then he bit the end off of a heather bloom in cigar when a man gets played it good for a sucker like we was he mused a couple of dollars more or less won't harm him none that's what my uncle max says when he sees you up at the heatherbloom inn yesterday ralph commented he seen me up at the heatherbloom inn morris cried how should he see me up at the heatherbloom inn i thought he was made it arrested sure he was made it arrested ralph said but he fixed it up all right at the station house and the sergeant lets him out so he goes up to the heatherbloom inn because he went right back to the hotel to see after that miss taylor the carriage agent tells him a feller chases him up in an automobile to the Heatherbloom Inn. But when Uncle Max gets up there, you look like you was having such a good time already he hates to interrupt you, so he goes back to the store again. Morris puffed violently at his cigar. That's a fine piece of work, he said. That Max Tuchman is. Ralph nodded. Sure he is, he replied. Uncle Max is an up-to-date feller. End of chapter 10